So that getting being said, ZBrush, digital sculpting, making cool stuff all the time. That's like my philosophy. That's what I live by every day. So if you're new to ZBrush, just really, really quickly, we have a ton of getting started series on maxon.net that really just breaks down how to navigate this program really simply and really quickly. So if you have any questions, you can also see me afterwards. But let's get into this and what we're doing today. First and foremost, I actually have a present for you guys, which is this Raptor we 3D printed. And I'm gonna start here. And what you're looking at is this in toy format or res basically a statue. And so what we wanna do today is pretty much showcase how I went from this to that. Now, real quick, it's not, okay. <laughs> it's not articulated, so you can't move it. It's glued together. But basically, if you had any interest whatsoever on making something from a digital world to a physical world, you're in the right spot. Because I'm going to show you how we went from this model and sliced it up with keys. So let's quickly look at a render of what it is you're looking at. So, up. Oh, wait, we need to switch it over, hopefully. One second. It's still showing ZBrush. Hold on. If it doesn't flip over, we switch back to ZBrush. Boop -a -doop -a -doop -a -doop. OK, let's actually just do this real quick. I'm going to zoom this out. I'm going to hit Shift X. And we're just going to rotate around and really just taking a look at this figure. And you can see here that we have some holes in the backside and in the front side of the Raptor, as well as the Raptor's head it has this like kind of square tapered key. And same thing on the tail and on the base. And these are basically keys that insert and connect into each other so that they can actually, oh, hold on. OK, cool. So while we wait, because right now we're having a little bit of technical difficulty, so I do apologize. But as we wait, let me just explain this fun 3D model for you real quick. So I printed this in resin printing, or resin, yeah, resin. It's, not, it's just resin. I don't know why I'm trying to explain it more than this. So I printed this in resin, which is ABS Fast Cure Resin. Usually resin like this is usually brittle. And so if I were to drop it, carpet might catch it, but if it'd be, it could shatter and stuff like that. So usually this is used for fast prototyping. And when you're doing fast prototyping, the idea is that you don't want to spend a lot of time printing something that is inevitably just going to be rejected at the end of the process, right? So in total time, I'm going to do a pop quiz and see how many hours do you think this took to, uh, to print in total, including the base? Four, six, or 12? Anyone? You. Bam, right on the money. This took six hours. It was set up in two different processes. And I ultimately do have a small video of me actually supporting it using Lychee Slicer, which we may not, perfect, thank you, which we may not get into today. But um, I could showcase real quickly kind of what that looks like. And I do plan on having future presentations about actually supporting your prints when you move into an external slicer, which is what you need for 3D printing. So I do see we have some new people. So let's just keep this floating around. There we go. And now we're going to go ahead and get back into it. So if I sh yes, OK. So this is why I wanted to show you, because I thought this was really, really cool. So this is a Redshift render of my model in the separate pieces. So you can really just clearly see how it fits together. And what's really cool about this, and this is something that when you're looking at 3D printing statues in general, what you want to focus on is the actual balance of the model itself. And right now, you can see that I had the base of that square in the middle, straight down. And then I have this long key by the foot that actually inserts into the, into the base itself. The base is solid because you usually want most of the weight down at the bottom. But because I wanted to make sure there wasn't too much weight on his single foot, which is pretty thin if you think about it, I wanted to make sure that there was, uh, it was hollowed. So then it can actually be lightweight in the middle. But then to counterbalance so it wasn't flimsy, the tail and the head are also solid. So this count acts as two counterweights to make sure that it stays secure. Now, most people, when they're making something that size that's floating around, usually they'll glue that into the base as well, especially after you painted it by hand. So you just kind of get a sense of what is going on. And if you really want to just see the tiny details in the teeth, all of those were printed at an angle that was self-supported, which is a really cool way to go about it. Ah, thank you. OK. So 
Now, how do we get from this boop, to that? So let's go in that today. We're going to cover some key cutting techniques and stuff. So first and foremost, and I'm six foot four, so if you see me crouch down a little bit, that's okay. So here, I have a bunch of different sub tools, but what we're going to do is we're going to focus on this one today. And I'm just going to come up here really quickly and clone that. So then we can just focus on this one that is happening. And I am definitely going to be making sure that I keep an eye on my time. So you can see here that I actually already have a key built right here. But how did I get to this point? So let's come back here really fast. And let's showcase. I'm going to hit solo mode for a second. So this is my original model right now. And the wireframe itself is pretty dense. If we zoom all the way in, you can see that what I had actually done was I went ahead and I used decimation, uh, map, no, sorry, I used Dynamesh to actually come through and make this watertight. So what does that mean? So if we come here to geometry and we come to Dynamesh, the idea of Dynamesh is that what it does is when I'm sculpting and I'm stretching the geometry, so if I were to take something like this move brush, and I'm really going to come through and stretch and stretch this out like that. So you can see that the actual mesh is breaking. So if I were to rebuild this, that control drag that I just did, what it's going to do is it's going to make sure any internal geometry that's sitting inside of the Raptor gets completely deleted. It closes holes, and it makes it watertight. And that's a term you're going to hear a lot of when we're talking about 3D printing, is a watertight mesh. So when we're focused on key cutting, the very first thing I did was I actually did have my base built. And where is that? Doo -doo -doo -doo. So I had my base here. And the thing that I wanted to make sure that when I was looking at the model itself, I'm going to go ahead and come through, is that it was positioned right where I want. Once you position things, you don't want to basically move it once you start setting it up, because we're going to be making very specific cuts. So let's come back here and let's showcase the fastest and coolest way, in my opinion, to make a key cut. And that's with live Boolean. Has anybody here used live Boolean before? No. Fun. So this is going to be awesome. So what is live Boolean? Live Boolean is basically the fastest way to cut a hole into any mesh you want and update it live. Let me just demonstrate real fast. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take a very simple cube, not super technical. And I'm going to go ahead and position this on just his back, just so we can get a demonstration. And now we're going to focus on over here, where you see my raptor. And then we also have these kind of, kind of bubble shapes here, right? Well, this one means union or merging. Then this one is actually a subtractive cut. And then this one is an intersect. So what does that mean to you? Well, basically, I want to cut, if I wanted to cut the top of his back with this cube, I would take my main object, make sure that's on top. I take my second object, make sure that's cutting. And then when I go to Live Boolean, you're actually going to see that now that shape disappeared, and now it's cut in here. But now, why is this special versus some other Boolean operations? Well, I said it was live. So I can take my gizmo, and I can move this around, and I can position it however I want, and it updates on the fly. This is a really great way to make sure that I see exactly what I'm cutting is true in the position I need it. And at any point in time, because it's just a live Boolean operation, this is just a preview to make sure that I'm getting exactly what I want. So if I turn off live Boolean, you'll see there's my, there's my little rectangle shape. Hit it again, and it's just constantly there. Now, if you hit Shift F, which usually shows you your polyframe, in live Boolean mode, you'll see it has like this kind of anti-aliasing effect. And that's just to let you know where that object actually is. And so I can come through and fight quick select, and I'm just kind of you know, working on my raptor. The other cool part about that is if I needed to shape my raptor around this area, you can see here that the cut is being respected the entire time. So it's constantly updating live for you, which is just exactly what we want. So now the cool way to make a key after that long explanation, I'm going to come through and actually delete this. And we're going to go ahead and actually cut his head off today. So we're going to go through. And I'm going to insert a plain 3D for this. And we're just going to focus on the plain 3D. So I'm going to go ahead, full frame this by hitting F. And I'm just going to hit solo mode for a second. 
Now I'm gonna turn that wireframe on and you can see here that I have just a bunch of simple geometry. And we're gonna simplify this a little bit. So I'm gonna to go to geometry and I'm just gonna go ahead and reconstruct my subdivisions down a couple times. This is just gonna rebuild what was once previously there. And I'm gonna go ahead and delete higher. And now I have this basic shape. From here, we're gonna jump into Z Modeler. So I'm gonna hit B, Z, M. And now I'm gonna come through and with symmetry turned on by hitting X, I'm just gonna select these two, uh, you know, these two polys right here. And I'm gonna hover over, press the space bar, and we're gonna Q mesh this. Q mesh is basically ZBrush's way of extruding, but it also respects edge loops. In this, in this example, you're not really gonna see that too much, but in future examples, which I have on the maxon.net website, you can actually see what that looks like. So from here, I'm gonna Q mesh, and I'm gonna drag this out. Now, the reason why I'm only doing these couple is because I wanna make sure that I have enough space to actually slice all the way across my object and do the actual key cut. And we're building both the male and the female key cuts at the same time using this process. So now I'm gonna come through on the side. I'm gonna mask off this front section. And if you're a cool kid like me, you're gonna press and hold Alt at the same time, let go, and that does a reverse mask. So the thing that I was, quote, masking, I didn't have to flip it. I can just come through, press and hold Alt, come in, press and hold Alt, move that forward. And then we're just gonna scale this down and kind of just adjust that taper however we would like to do that. What's neat about building your own keys is that it really is dependent on the size of the model and you can adjust how deep or shallow something should be or how wide or narrow something should be. So in this case, this will be fine. Now we're gonna introduce the second feature which is dynamic subdivision. And the reason for that, if we come over to dynamic subdiv and turn on dynamic, you'll see here that this kind of rounds, but I don't want that. I want a nice sharp edge. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit shift D to undo that preview. And if you hit D, it's gonna ask you, you wanna preview dynamic? You're like, yes, this is a cool feature. So always say yes. So I can shift between the two by shift D or D really quickly. So I can always see what's going on. Now we're gonna do just some quick modeling real fast, adding some edge loops to support the shape of this. So I'm gonna come through, hit B, Z, M, and I'm just gonna hover over this edge, press and hold the space bar, and we're already set to insert, but I wanna insert multiple edge loops, and I wanna keep the same poly groups. So I'm just gonna go ahead and add in a few of these, add in one or two of these, tap real quick to repeat that action, there we go. And something like that should be good enough for what we're trying to go for. Now, if I hit D again, you can see here that it's a lot softer, a lot rounder. It's not as sharp. That's okay. Another method, if you want it tack sharp, you're like, I absolutely want this to be as sharp as possible. You can actually go to polygroups and you can go to group by normals. And now every face that's either like a 45 degree angle or greater, is going to give you a different polygroup. And what polygroups are, if you're not sure, is a very nice way of organizing and selecting your faces based on the normal. So I can come through and just work on this face if I wanted to, hiding the rest by hitting Control Shift. But we're not gonna worry about that today. The other cool thing about it is we're gonna come up to Geometry. We're gonna go to Crease. So let's actually close this menu, go to Crease. Crease by Polygroups, boop. So now if I hit D again, look how sharp that is. So this is the preview, this is not the preview. So this is a way to really keep a nice sharp key the entire time. Now, the second thing we're gonna do is we're actually gonna give this some thickness because we wanna make sure that we're cutting something that's actually gonna fit into each other. And right now this is a single-sided geometry, which means it's, it's, thin as pa <laughs> it's thinner than paper, it's super thin, it's never gonna work. So we're gonna actually add some thickness and again, dynamic subdiv is a preview. So if I come through and start adding some thickness to this, you can see here that now I have an open side on one and a closed side on the other. And this is gonna create both fitting keys at the exact same time. So now what do we do with this? We made our key, congratulations. What do you do, Ian? Well, easy enough, we're gonna come through and now place it. So I'm gonna actually set this back to zero and if you want, what you can always do is just control shift D to duplicate this key and call this OG key. That's what I like to call them. And then I'm gonna go ahead and just hide that. 
and now I'm just dealing with the one. This way I can actually not have to try to manipulate the same key too many times. I can just come back and grab a spare if I need it. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and scale this down. And now, remember I talked about that plane having enough distance to cut. So I'm going to rotate this in a way that makes sense to me. So I think the head should like fit inwards. And now I'm going to just kind of guess on where I think this will fit. Now here's the cool part, is that I'm going to go ahead and hit this transparency tool. And this is going to help me really just see inside the model and just see how that is actually fitting. So I can come through and make sure that it's as center as possible. And see here, his neck's actually rotating. And this is pretty straight on. So I can actually rotate this around and see if this actually fits something like that. And then what we can do is this key is actually looking quite thick. Like this is actually massive. So we don't want that much of a space. So this is where that preview shape comes in. So I'm going to go dynamic subdiv. And I'm just going to go ahead and kind of estimate where that should be. Drop that down, maybe something more like this. Now, this number that I'm doing is kind of arbitrary at this point. It doesn't really matter. We're just getting an idea of what this is going to look like. And once we're satisfied with this, if I wanted to, I didn't really manipulate this that much. I did change the thickness. I'll just Control-Shift-D one more time. And I'm going to go ahead and actually put this by the tail. And we're going to move this in. Rotate it around, so I'm just using the color, colored wheels to rotate. Because in ZBrush, the, uh, the rotation, the scale, and the movement are always active at the same time. So I'm going to come through and kind of place this something like this. Now, usually, when you're prepping for 3D printing, this is a process that takes a while. I'm just flying through this because I only have an hour. <laughs> So, but usually take your time, really check it out. It doesn't really matter. Like you want to make sure that this is done right. And if you are used to 3D printing, you kind of know that materials have a shrink value. And I'm going to slightly gloss over that today. But if you want to know more about that afterwards on my demo booth, come ask me about it. But essentially, every material, once you print it from liquid to solid, it's going to shrink just a little bit. And so usually what I recommend is you create like a just 25.4 millimeter cube and go and test print that and then measure it with a pair of calipers. And that will tell you how something on your machine will actually shrink based on the material and the, the actual machine itself. Every machine is different. They're like our best friends. You can only have one. So just keep it through. So now we're going to go through. I don't know if that made sense, actually. I saw you laugh and I was like, what did I just say? OK. <laughs> All right, so now we have, we've used the same key for the same process, right? So now the magic part comes in. I'm going to go ahead and light boolean is turned on. So let's come back to our subtool. Now in ZBrush, we actually have this thing called folders that we can utilize and group things together. And this is going to make key cutting really, really simple. Before, we actually had like a child-parent relationship. And while that's still effective in some situations, I prefer the folder. So what I'm going to do, the quickest way to get the folders in, everything that you want in the folder together, turn on the gizmo. And then this guy right here, which is the transpose all selected subtools, AKA the pizza box, we're going to go ahead and click that. And now with shift and control, I'm just going to quickly drag select those three, those three objects. Because I have a, a fourth object in the scene, I'm not selecting that one. So when now when I hit control F, it's going to say everything that you have visible, you're trying to throw into a folder. And I'm going to say, yep. And let's go ahead and name that. So let's name that our Raptor cut. Boop. And now everything just got thrown into a folder, which is perfect. And also, it respected our hierarchy. So we had our Raptor on top, and then the keys underneath, which is exactly the way you're going to want it in order to make these cuts possible. And now from here, let's make sure our keys are set back at that actual cut. And you'll notice they disappeared. But if we zoom in a little bit closer, just a little bit closer, we're going to come through. And you can see that we're starting to see that cut there. Now, time for the boring stuff. We have math. Math is always fun, right? So we need to size this. ZBrush's strength is that it's a creative tool that allows you to make whatever you want, however you want, whenever you want. Except for we kind of made sure that we don't have to worry about the math stuff. The math stuff comes last, and that's where we are right now in this process. So we, let's make sure that our, our, our Raptor is sized exactly as we want. So the easiest way to do that, it comes natively with ZBrush. Under the Z plugin, 
We're just gonna throw that on over, that menu over here to the left-hand side by just hitting this nice little dot right there. And that's gonna dock it on the left side. And we're gonna come on down to Scale Master. And now this is where the fun stuff comes in. So what we can do is we wanna make sure we get the exact size of our Raptor, right? Well, I could just make a box and tear it and tug it and say, boom, there it is. Except for that would take forever and it's not gonna be accurate. So instead, we have this thing called New Bounding Box Subtool. I'm gonna click this and immediately it created a bounding box that is the exact size in height, width, and depth for my Raptor. If we go ahead and turn on the actual transparency, you can kind of see that ghosty Raptor in there. And if I zoom in a little bit, you'll see right up to the, the tip of his snout, to the tip of his tail, all the way down to the bottom of the key, and also the width. You can see he's like charging at you here. Might be a little hard to see online, but you can see the tail. Everything was accounted for, and this is the exact size of my Raptor. This is our control shape to make sure that our scale is correct, all right? So from here, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna come up and say set scene scale because right now ZBrush works in units or millimeters and you can see that it is based on one. So ZBrush works in a very small scale. And so here we can actually say, you know what, let's set scene scale. Now when we do this, we wanna make sure that we're actually setting the scale on the object and we're maintaining that that's our control object. So what I mean is every time I set scene scale, I don't wanna set it to the head and set it to the tail and set it to the base and go back to the cube. That's bouncing around and when you export, that's where you might get something that you thought was 200 millimeter and it's actually, you know, maybe 200 feet. So you wanna make sure that it is not actually, you know, that the size itself is maintained properly. So here we get a few options. Zebras gives us millimeter, centimeters, feet and inches. So you have imperial and as well as metric. 3D printing tech tip of the day, if you forget all of this mumbo jumbo I'm throwing at you, 3D printing and the metric system, yes, it goes hand in hand. I have friends who have tossed me inch files and it comes up teeny tiny and I'm like, bro, what did you give me? Like go rescale that. So millimeters, stay in millimeters, I implore you, please, please, please. You could say Ian told me to stay in millimeters and I will back you, just remember that. So we're gonna say millimeter and notice here it's giving me 57.92 by 123.17 by 200, which is perfect, that's what I want. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, yep, that is it. And now here, you can see that that is my scale. Do I have to now say resize subtool? Only if I want that to be bigger or smaller, but actually this came in at a pretty good size. But let's say you did wanna rescale this because I prepped this file ahead of time and your viewers might actually say that it's really, really tiny. So let's say we wanna make it just a little bit smaller. So the way to do that is we're gonna keep all of the axes on at the same time. And we're gonna say maybe this time we want this to be 150 millimeter. Client came back and said 200 is too big. Shrink it down a little bit because I'm trying to do a one, one pole mold. I don't know, something. <laughs> I just threw an example. So now we're gonna say that. And then we're gonna go down here and say, resize subtool with that all selected. And that's going to do the X, Y, and Z all at the same time. So let's do that. And you can see here, everything is now warping at the speed of light. Boom, you just resized it. Now you can check and say, did this actually do it? And the way to do that is make sure your bounding box is still selected. Come up here, say set scene scale. And now you'll see here that it did confirm 150 millimeter. So I would just pick that. And that's how you can confirm that that's the right size. But once you size it, you're locked, you're good to go. Now, every once in a while, you might get a little error message that pops up. I call it an error message, it's really not. It's more of just a little message that's coming up and saying, hey, your size has exceeded 100 on the X, Y, and Z. Do you wanna continue? That just means that your scene was probably massively big, and then you went to rescale it at a size much larger, and it exceeded ZBrush's viewport. Just hit OK, and then it will resize all down back to a normal size. It's gonna reset everything back to a neutral point, then scale it. So if you ever get that message, just read it, and just be like, yes, that's totally fine. I also do implore that you save a project when you're doing this, because everything that you're building, you don't wanna lose that. So it's okay to save a project, and the way to do that, let's come up here to the file, save as, and we can say this, I called it Raptor Prep, we'll call this Raptor Prep 2, boom. Let that save, and that's gonna save everything, including my original project, 
as well as any keys I make. So that's a way to go about it. All right, we're doing pretty good on time. So now, what do we do with this information here? Well, we scaled it, and we're working at a real size. Now we want to go ahead and kind of check and make sure that we're getting something that looks good. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off the transparency. And we can see that our key cuts are happening. And now this is what's really cool about the preview. Because we have an actual size that is locked in, and now we know that we're actually making a good key cut, I told you this was the boring part. We got to check our math. <laughs> so from here, we can actually measure pretty quickly in ZBrush. So I'm going to turn on the gizmo, which is this guy right here. But then I'm going to hit Y. And if you're an old school ZBrush user, you might recognize this fun little guy, which is the transpose line. But I really want you to pay attention to these hashes. These are actually measurement marks. Now that we set our scheme, the actual transpose tool updates itself to accommodate for the size of the model. And there, it's actually going to kind of break this up in a way that makes sense. So we can actually now measure effectively with the scale master. So I can come all the way into this. Now, typically, I'm going to throw a number at you. For me and my machine, the printer shrink rate is about 0 0.0015 millimeter, which is less than a human hair distance. So it's pretty small. But sometimes you don't want to go straight to the wire. You want to give yourself a little bit of space. So I usually go to like 0 0.0. Yeah, sometimes I go like 0 0.0025, something like that. So it just depends on the machine. So here, I'm going to come through and just kind of give me a rough estimate based on what I know. So I'm going to come in and say, you know what, with that, I'm going to line this up somewhere that it just looks nice. I'm going to come in and just kind of drag this down. Now, if I hit Shift, it's going to pick one point to the other. Sorry, I said 0, .0. I meant point 0.1. My math is off. So now this is right here says point. 2.5. Let me correct myself. So sorry, go back real fast. Boop, 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 boop. So I meant 0 0.15, 0 0.1. That's usually shrink rate. Here, I have almost double that. So if I measure that again from this point to this point, I get 0.2363, which is four places in decimal. That's actually quite accurate. So that will be good enough. This is actually quite big. I may take time to adjust it. But again, every machine's different, so I implore you to play with different options. And if you want to dive down more into the 3D printing realm and all that fun, boring stuff that we're going to gloss over today, please feel free to talk to me over there or just research it. It's, there's just so much in depth with 3D printing. But in that being said, that's going to be close enough for today to go through. If I wanted to adjust it, what's really fun is that I can actually come here to geometry and I can come back down to that dynamics. Uh, um, I can come back down to that thickness, and now here, I can actually shrink that down if I would like. So let's actually go a little bit more. Now, like I said, this number here is arbitrary to the actual size of our measurement. This thickness is just giving us the kind of preview that we may want. So I'm actually going to drop this down just a little bit more. Just kind of get like something guess. When it, red, when it lights up red like that, I could type in like 0 0.0015. Yeah. And then we can come through and actually remeasure that. Say something like that. And I actually went much larger. So now that says 0.3. So now I know I can just actually come down to maybe 0 0.001. Say something like that. So again, you could definitely play with it, see what you get. So yeah, that's fine. We'll call it at 0.214. So now we have the size that we want. So we can actually take this thickness. And let's hit F real quick. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to turn on the wireframe by hitting Shift F. And I'm going to come to this one and do the same thing, 0 0.001. And I know that I measured the one side, and this is the exact same key. So now this is going to give me the same result on that side. And so now that we're all said and done, we can actually make our cut. Now, there's two ways to go about doing this. Okay? The first way to go about doing it is to apply on the key our dynamic subdiv. This turns it from a preview to actual mesh. And I can use the arrow key to select the second one, say apply. And then I can come up here to my folder. I like to close my folder when I do this operation. It's just habit. And then I'm going to come up with this cogwheel. And then I'm going to come through. Now we're going to say Boolean that folder. Now we have two Boolean options. We have Boolean folder and Boolean with dynamic subdiv. So if I pick Boolean with folder without applying the dynamic subdiv manually, it's going to give me the thin plane cut which means it's not going to work. 
all your math just went out the window. So here in this operation, I'm going to say Boolean folder because I applied it. And it's going to think for a second. Boop. There we go. Finished. And now I have this mesh. Now this mesh has been cut, but notice it's still all merged together. But if I zoom all the way in there, we got a polygroup, which is awesome. So the fastest way to check to make sure that you cut your key correctly is we're actually going to come on down here to polygroups. And I'm going to hit full frame for this. And then now, just so you can see, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the line so we're just looking at color, because that's really dark. And I'm going to go ahead and say auto group. And if you cut your keys correctly, which I did not hear on this one, you'll see that the polygroups now change. And that's OK. When you make a mistake, you don't doesn't cut right the first time. We just need to go back and say, why didn't it cut? So we can actually come back up here. So you know what? Let's delete this guy. And let's go back in. And let's take a look at this key and see what happens. And do, 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 do. Let's actually turn everything back on. So let's come up to our sub tool, turn that folder on. And we can see here that, for whatever reason, that key was there. So let's see if we could troubleshoot real quick. It was turned off. And if it's turned off, it's not going to necessarily cut. So that might have been the reason. Let's just go ahead and make sure it is cutting all the way through. And let's make sure that our geometry dynamic subdiv is turned off. OK, cool. So let's now try that operation one more time. The eye was turned off, so maybe that's why. We'll give it one more shot. If not, you're going to see troubleshooting live, because that is the life of an artist. We make mistakes. We're never perfect, and we always have to keep trying. All right, so let's do this one more time. Up. Oh, all right, there we go. I do see a polygroup there. So let's hit F one more time. Let's come back down here to do, 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 polygroups. I see it, I swear. There it is. Auto groups. Boom. There it is. So there you go. Make sure all your tools are turned on before you make the operation. And you're good to go. So easy peasy, lemon squeezy. All right, so now that we have this, let's go ahead and take a look at our shape. So we can see here internally, we have this female shape. And then if I go ahead and hit sh uh, shift control drag, you can see that I have the actual male shape there, which is perfect. So now what I can do is I can separate these out as independent tools so that when I export them for 3D printing, it's not merged together. I need them to be separate pieces. So I'm just going to quickly go to split, split hidden. I'm going to grab this guy. And I just, again, control shift tapped, uh, isolates the different polygroups. And then we're going to go ahead and say split hidden. And now we've made the cool key. That's the fastest way to really, really do it. We still have some time, so I might show you the second way to do it too which is really, that one's going to be really interesting. That might be a lot of steps, so I might fly past that. But what's fun about this now is, let's just finish this real quick. By We're ready to export at this point right here. But I want to point out the active points in total. Every slicer is different. I use Liji Slicer. It's one of my favorites. It's done by Tamal Roussel. You should definitely look at that one. What's fun about it is, 3D printing shapes, if you have like 250 million active polys, that's a lot of information to even throw out a slicer. So what I do is I quickly look at my active points, hit my arrow key, and I take a look at the different ones. This, this tail is only 286,000. This head's only 406. That's totally fine. That's reasonable size for any slicer to go through. This one, however, is 1.3 million active points. That might be a little heavy. Depends on the slicer. So what I'll do is I'll actually go up to Z plugin, and we're going to use a little fun friend called Decimation Master. And I don't have any color, any vertices. I don't have UVs, because the fun part about 3D printing is we don't care about the geometry. All we care about is the thing looks as good as we sculpted it, and we're ready to export. We don't need UVs. We don't need subdivisions, none of that stuff. We're actually working in a physical world. So in actual manufacturing, we just need to make sure that it, the shape holds through and can be put into the actual slicing tool. So here, I'm just going to go back up to the Z plugin. And let's scroll on down here. And we're just going to decimate this. And I have a custom setting set at 500, which equates to half a million. And that's perfect. For the amount of detail that's actually on this sculpt, I want to actually make sure <clears throat> that it actually holds. So now, what we're going to do is we're going to come through, and I'm just going to hit custom real quick. And we're going to let that process. And it might take a couple seconds. But what it's doing is basically it's triangulating. It's taking the mesh itself, calculating how well it needs to go to compress it. And then it's going to triangulate it down, kind of like in a tessellation format, and just bring it down. But it's going to retain the actual details. And now we can see here that it's about 500. 
And if we quickly take a look at this, this is, I'm gonna control Z. This is the before. I'm gonna stamp that. I'm gonna go control shift Z to step forward. So we went from 1.3 million to half. And you can see there's absolutely no difference between that. And you can actually step down further if you would like. Just to keep the example going, I'm actually going to go 150,000. There it is. And you can see here the resolution didn't change. And if you step down like that, you start really massive and you step down a couple times, you can get your models really low. And that's actually going to preserve a lot of detail, making it for better for other uh, applications to hold and process that information. But you can see here, there was no difference, and all of my sculpting there was retained. And that's actually the best part about it. We always want to make sure in the 3D print process that we are retaining the actual, and uh, we're retaining the information that the sculptor put on there. So here, this is good to go. So now we can come through. And again, we had our, our base shape here, so we can finalize this. So this is our bounding box, so I can actually come up here. Now we can start exporting these out. So we have another plugin for that, and that's our 3D print hub. And from here, now we want to make sure that we're actually going to be exporting out the proper size. And you can see here, we had a 150 millimeter shape, but if I come on up to Z plugin, you can see here that it doesn't actually know that information. It's still saying that it's basically an inch uh, squared. So instead, what we can do now is we actually need to set the, uh, the scale as well, because these two plugins are not talking to each other. They don't know what the other one did because they're two separate processes. So, in, so let's actually just dock that over here one more time. And again, like I said, you can go to your bounding box and you can update the size ratio. And you can see here, this is our actual size. That's inch. This is millimeter. Inches on this side, millimeters on this side. Before, millimeters was on this side. So don't get those crossed. <laughs> so come through and say, yep, that's the one that I want. That's 200 millimeter. And now I can come to X, because here now we can see, there it is. We can see their size is updated. And now we can come to export, and we can start exporting. And I can call this my STLs, call this uh, Raptor is cool. Boom. And now you can come through and say save. And now what's neat is you can actually, it gives you some options. Choice one is just allowing you to save the subtool based on this name that it's giving you. Or you use choice two, because I name my subtools, and I implore all of you to name your subtools. It's very important. Option two will allow you to retain that actual name. So I'm going to say, yep, <clears throat> and let it go through. And now I'll tell you everything was exported. And we can believe ourselves, because let's come here to our Raptor project. There's my folder. And now here it exported stuff. Now it exported everything. So if you want to export and only get the STLs that you absolutely need, you can go through and just delete those real quick, save your project, delete it the subtools you don't need. But more importantly here, I had names, I got my bounding box, I have my OG key, all that stuff exported out fairly well. <clears throat> it's thinking. We had one technical difficulty. Let's hopefully not make two. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, okay. Now I do see some new faces in the crowd. So can you do, can you do me a favor, one of you? Perfect, go ahead and pass that back around. So this is what we've been working on today, just as a fun little reminder. So this model that we were working on right now, we sculpted in ZBrush, and I just showed you how to make the key cuts, and then from there, that is the actual model that was made from this process. So for everybody who's new in the back, go ahead and check that out. And it's not articulated, so don't try to twist the head. That's not fun. <laughs> so this is what it looks like. All right, cool. Now we do have some time. We have about 15 minutes. So real quick, let me show you the other way, which I call it the older process. I'm gonna kind of speed through it so I don't take up too much time. But we're gonna go ahead and actually cut the base. Now let's go ahead and find that base real quick, which I had it right. Let's go ahead and come through. And let's find it. I think it was this guy right here. I'm gonna go ahead and copy that. I'm gonna come in. And we're done with this, and I'm feeling pretty froggy, so I'm going to leap and delete some stuff I don't think I need anymore. And I'm going to go ahead and paste, and now this is the base itself. So now let's, let's cut this base. 
And now I still do this technique, even though I just called it the older technique. This is where this technique actually comes into play. I want to make sure that my actual raptor fits in the base correctly, which is this guy right here. That's the only reason why I didn't have it passing around, is because it's not glued together. But what we can do is we want to make sure that it fits. So this is where naming is going to come in. This is my main raptor, so I'm going to call them main final, final, final. You guys know, right? Cut, boom. We're so certain that this is the right key cut. So now we're going to go ahead and save that there. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to control, I'm going to control, <laughs> control shift D duplicate because I want to actually use the same exact model, but I'm going to inflate it a little bit, make it a bit bigger. But I'm still going to come through and use live Boolean to get this operation done. So I'm going to put this in a folder, call this cut base, boom. And we're going to go ahead and just hide everything else that we don't need. You can do that by holding Shift and tapping on all the eyes, and then just selecting the things that you absolutely do need. And I need this base right here. I'm going to drag this down. Now, I need the base on top this time, not the raptor, because I'm cutting the base. So every time you're cutting the main object, that object needs to be on top. So now I'm going to go ahead and turn that on. And now I'm going to move the base to the raptor, not the other way around, only because I made all my key cuts in that position. And just for my own sanity and OCD, I'm going to make sure that that stays there. So I'm going to move this on up. And then what I'm going to do is just come through here. Let's actually give us a little bit more viewport and just kind of make sure I eye that as close as possible. Now, because we're set in scale, what we can do here is we can actually come in Come on down to def uh, deformation, and I have the raptor selected. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to inflate this a little bit. Now, you might be thinking, when you inflate it, it's going to bubble just a tiny bit, right? It's going to round things. That's OK, too, because that's going to give us some more space in the actual cutting. So you can have a tack sharp cut like we made. That's totally fine. And once you make sure that the, key, that the cut is good distance, then you're going to be good. When you put glue in there and squeeze it in there, it's going to fill and flow correctly. Well, any, if you get a little bit of rounding and distorting, but it's slightly bigger and that key's still going to fit in, that's going to help the glue flow, flow, flow a little bit better. So it's OK that you might get a little bit, because the thing we're, def, uh, we're actually deforming isn't going to be really the final object. We copied this for that reason. So in this case here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to inflate this by like 1, maybe. Maybe 1.5. So we'll just call it 1 for now, just to kind of show, because we don't have too, too much time. And then what I'm going to do here boop, 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 is we're going to come back up to our subtool. And now I'm going to go ahead. Live bullying is still turned on. I'm going to make that an active cut. And now you can see here that that's actually cutting into the rock a little bit. And then there's that base right there. And now here, what's really fun is that we're going to just come in and we're going to go through the same operation. We're going to come through and say Boolean folder. And then when I make this cut, it's going to come through. There it is. There's our main cut. And now we're going to want to go ahead and just kind of check this a little bit. And so it looks like my resolution kind of deform just a little bit. So I may restart ZBrush in a second just to kind of show down the um, solo buttons that I need. But here, what we're going to do, let's actually come here. Doop, 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 doop. Here, let me see something real fast. That's ah, going to be fine. So in fact, we're just going to go through. We have our main Raptor right here. We're going to come in. And you can actually see from this position that there is a little bit of spacing. Now, because my screen kind of just like re it refreshed in a weird way, just based on the crazy technical difficulties that thank you guys for hanging out with us so far, that kind of did. I'm just going to measure this real fast based on these spots. So I'm just going to zoom in here. Usually what I would do is actually come through. You know what? Forget it. <clears throat> Let me do this real fast. I'm going to come up here to Preferences, Config. If you actually want to. Um, Actually, we're going to go here to Interface UI. And let's see if I can make this a little bit smaller. No, I can't make that a little bit smaller. That's fine. No worries. Um, what we're going to do, usually what you can do, you've seen solo mode. I'll do solo mode, and then I'll turn around and actually do the, uh, 
I'll do the transparency just so I can see inside of it a little bit clearly. But this will work for now. I'm going to turn, there we go. I'm going to turn on my gizmo by hitting W. That was my transpose. I'm going to zoom all the way in real fast, quick and in a hurry. And then I'm going to come through and I'm going to measure the spot. And we can see here that we're getting a measurement of almost 0.1. So that might be a little bit small because we did 0.2 on the last one. So then you can just resize that. So that tells us something very interesting, though. I did deformation of 1, and it gave me 0.1. So now that's going to be the same math when I go ahead and make this cut again. So if I wanted to make this 2, then let's actually delete this guy. Let's come back up here. Let's turn on this box. Let's come into this raptor, go back to our deformation real fast. Make sure he's selected. Yep, he's selected. And let's do one, one more time. That inflates him one more, one more. So now it should be 0.2, right? So now we're going to come through here and let's come in and let's go ahead and boolean our folder real fast. Give ZBrush a little second. There it is. That's awesome. Let's actually hide this guy real quick. Let's kind of zoom in there. Scale that down just a teeny, teeny bit. Perfect. I'm going to move in. Now I'm going to go ahead and measure that distance to distance. And that gives me about 0.235. So perfect. So that's a good shape. So that's ready for export as well. So that would be the other way to cut. We still use live Boolean. But originally, I just made a, a pretty much, I just made this shape. And then I just used DynaMesh to weld that all together. And then from there, I just took the Raptor, duplicated it cut it in, and we are good to go. So then here, I can come through now, go back up to our Z plugin, which is now over here. Beautiful. And I can export that STL. Say sure. Base. All about that base. Perfect. And actually, I'm going to hit Escape real quick. I'm going to copy this. I'm going to paste this. Actually, let's clone it. Let's come up here to clone. I'm going to hit clone so that it's in solo object, because I just need that one. I don't need to save everything else out again. Let's come up here to Z plugin. I'm going to go ahead and say export and say, yeah. And again, if you wanted to at this point, you could just say, hey, make sure you see our size ratio. If I hit update size here on this one object, this could cause that conflict like I spoke with before. We already made sure our scale master was set on that measurement of the original Raptor. So I would say refrain from updating too often. You might find a size barrier. We updated that once, so we don't want to make sure we, we don't want to complicate too many things. So just we don't have to go through this process. But if you're curious on the size of this exactly, like you need to know, then you could come back here and check it. Just hit Escape, and that won't update that size ratio. So now we're here. And again, we only have a few minutes. So I have a quick video to just kind of talk about what I did after this process. So real fast, I'm going to come through. Let's actually close this video down. And like I said, I had used Ligi Slicer to do this next process. But I ended up, let's go ahead and double click this real fast so you can kind of see how we got to the next part. So I, this is Ligi Slicer. Just made a recording of me doing it because I didn't think I had enough time to do it here. But I went ahead. And I drop that model in. And I angled and positioned this in a way that was actually going to support the print process. You can see that the key is actually up, but I wanted to hollow the body. So I ended up making sure that the key was at an angle of about 45 degrees. So then when I would print this, I would actually have to create drain holes in the actual body so that when it's, salt, when it's hollow printing, you don't, um, you don't call with, uh, create what's called suction. Because if there's no ventilation of the actual model, it could actually pull the FET film up and just destroy your printer. So you want to make sure that you hollow your model. So I angled it in that position. And then from here, came through, and I did a hollow process. And I made sure that there was actual holes in there. There was at least a minimum of two holes so that it can actually have air come through and also drain out. And so that's what it looks like a little bit. And then really quickly, right here, see if I hit the button real fast. What I did was, what's cool about a lot of slicers now is the technology is updated. So I was able to just generate automatic supports with a click of a button, which, do, 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 do. Yep, I do it right about here. And what that's going to do is it just calculates really fast. 
It's just faster than me doing it manually in ZBrush. There are times in ZBrush where I have actually created very specific supports because I understood the process and I knew this had to be supported in a certain way that other uh, slicers couldn't do. So in this case, you know, I was like, I just need to print this and it's okay. So I just hit automatic, it generated for a second. And then this is what the slicing actually looks like. I mean, sorry, what the supports look like. Then I went through and just quickly edited it to make sure that I got something that I wanted. And then afterwards, I exported it. And the export process is really cool because the way 3D printing works, for those of you who don't know, is it's basically like printing on paper and then stacking that paper on top of each other. Your layer lines come through one after the other. So each white piece that you're looking at, white's going to be what's printed, black is, what, is what's going to be ignored because it's a UV process. So think of this as a really complicated mask. And it's just about 2,282 different masks that make up just the body of this raptor. And you can see it's actually hollowed in there. It's a really cool process, really, really fun stuff. And once all of that is said and done, that is how we ultimately go from this ZBrush model right here, boop, this fun little dude right here, to something that looks a lot like this guy right here. All right, all right. Any questions? I knew I threw just a ton of information at everybody, but if anybody would like to see what this looks like, you can come on up and uh, come check it out. But yeah, that's going to be pretty much my presentation. So thank you all for hanging out with me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.